What is the big problem with Hume's reduction of the self to perceptions? Overall, Hume saw the mind as a kind of theater stage, across which ideas pass. With each idea a separate existence of sense or logical relation. He did not address the implied question of whom the audience is that has access to this theater. What he was looking for and failed to find was an object of reflection that could in a unitary distinct way, justify the term self. He was not looking for the reflector, or the eye in search of itself. He simply assumed that this reflector was not the self he was. Looking for when one enters most intimately into what I call myself. Another way of putting this is that Hume's analysis of the self cannot account for that process of analysis, of reflecting on one's own ideas. Hume did not take into account the fact that he was reflecting. And that the thing he was that was reflecting is what is meant by the word self. How were Locke's ideas about substance related to his theory of knowledge? Locke confined knowledge to sensory information and the workings of the mind. And he had a moderate skepticism about claims beyond those two sources of information. Locke introduced his essay concerning human understanding. 1689, as the result of conversations among friends which led to the question of what it was possible for them to know. Given the limitations of human faculties, it was necessary to examine our own abilities. And see what objects our understandings were or were not fitted to deal with. Locke's method was not to rely on tradition or what other philosophers had claimed. But to look to the things themselves. Knowledge, according to Locke, was direct awareness of some fact. The only facts we can know are those that consist of relationships among our ideas. A fact is something true about the world. Locke did not think that we had direct experience of the world. Things in the world acted on our sense organs to produce ideas. Therefore, the truths we know, facts, are about the relationships between ideas. Ideas are mental objects for Locke, some of which are representations of things in the world. In Book I of the essay, Locke attacks the rationalist doctrine of innate ideas and innate knowledge. His argument is that we have innate capacities, but nothing like knowledge until there is. Experience this is Locke's famous description of the mind as a tabula rasa, or blank slate. In Book 2, he explains our different types of ideas by tracing them to sensation and reflection on sensation. Reflection consists of combination, division, generalization, and abstraction. For Locke, our ideas are like impressions from experience. When we consider our ideas in our minds, we can combine different ideas, divide an idea into more ideas. Generalize about what ideas in a group share, or abstract some property shared by a group of ideas. In Book 3, Locke explains how words can mislead us about facts or the things themselves. 
Book 4 is a discussion of how we are obligated to conduct our minds in forming beliefs. So as not to stray too far from what we know. Kant's motivating metaphysical question was. How is it possible to know certain principles about the world, without prior experience? Kant's solution was to apply a transcendental deduction to such principles and show that without them experience would not be possible. For example, Concerning causation, he argued that consciousness itself requires orderly experience based on necessary connections in reality. This was Kant's answer to David Hume's 1711 to 1776 reduction of causation to constant conjunction. He rejected Hume's skepticism that constant conjunction is all that there is by claiming that the world could only make sense to us if we assumed that that there were real causal connections in it. In his Prolegomena to Every Future Metaphysics, 1783, Kant famously said that Hume had awakened him from his dogmatic slumbers. Is Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative different from the Golden Rule? Yes, it is. According to the Golden Rule, we should act as we would have others act toward us. If our tastes are perverted or we do not care for our own welfare, the golden rule could permit acts of depravity and violence, but such acts could never be willed categorically. Moreover, Kant's system is strongly based on individual good. Will toward the community of all other rational individuals. There is a debt to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's, 1712-1778, idea of the common good here. Indeed, Kant greatly respected Rousseau's moral philosophy. What was Locke's solution to the Cartesian mind-body problem? Locke held that all of our knowledge comes to us from our ideas and that we do not have a clear idea of either material or immaterial substance. It follows from this that if substance exists, we do not know anything about it, apart from its qualities that adhere in it. For example, Locke pointed out that we can sense the hardness, color, and malleability of gold. But that we do not know what it is in gold that gives rise to these qualities. He addressed unextended or non-material substance under the subject of personal identity. Asking what it is that makes someone the same person. Locke was concerned that when a person was punished on Judgment Day, that the person being punished was the same person who had committed the crimes he or she was charged with. His answer was that in the context of divine reward or punishment on that great day, you are the same person if you have memories of yourself in the past so that you know it is the same you who committed the acts for which you are being judged. 
Locke's refusal to posit a form or substance for the soul seemed to contradict. The Trinitarian doctrine of three attributes or natures present in one God. Some of his critics, such as British theologian Edward Stillingfleet, accused Locke of denying the possibility of resurrection in the absence of an incorruptible, immaterial soul substance. Locke's reply to Stillingfleet was to reaffirm his belief in the immortality of the soul. As a matter of faith, rather than a fact that could be proved by reason. Stillingfleet believed that some substantial form of a person's body was necessary for there to be a resurrection of that person. Locke's response was to make fun of Stilling Fleet by interpreting him to claim that the same body literally had to arise from the grave. Locke wrote, and I think your lordship will not say that the particles that were separate from the body by perspiration before the point of death were laid up in the grave. Who was Rousseau? Jean Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, was an original political philosopher who may have contributed more than any other single person to the motivations for the French Revolution. He was, in addition, a highly creative novelist capable of gathering a reading public into a community that lived vicariously through his characters. Some locking themselves up for days to sentimentally enjoy his latest novel. For these reasons, Rousseau may have been the first modern celebrity philosopher. What was Immanuel Kant's theory of the self? Kant distinguished between the empirical ego and the transcendental ego. The empirical ego is what we normally think of as the self and are able to experience. The transcendental ego is the necessary origin of those fundamental structures of thought and intuition that are necessary for experience. The transcendental ego is known only as an object of thought, and not as an object of direct experience. Did Hume believe in miracles? Probably not, although he did not explicitly deny them. Hume's arguments were directed toward assessing the truth of reports of miracles. Such assessment would address the credibility of witnesses and the remoteness in time and distance of their accounts. Hume thought that if someone reported a miracle, we should ask this question, which is more likely. Based on everything we know about the world, that the miracle happened, or that it did not. Who were the Cambridge Neoplatonists? The founder of the group was understood to be Benjamin Whichcote, 1609-1683. Whichcote called reason the candle of the Lord. Henry Moore, 1614-1687, Ralph Cudworth. 
1617 to 1688, and John Smith, 1616 to 1652, were three further distinguished Cambridge Platonists. Cudworth was the father of John Locke's lifelong friend and lady. Of the household in which he spent his last years, Damaris Cudworth. Additional Cambridge Platonists of note were Nathaniel Culverwell, 1619 to 1651, Peter Sterry, 1613 to 1672, George Rust, D. 1670, John Worthington, 1618 to 1671, and Simon Patrick, 1626 to 1707. Witchcote, Moore, Cudworth and Smith were associated with Emmanuel College. Calvinism was the leading doctrine there and they all rebelled against it. Henry Moore was the most intellectually active member of the group. Was Emmanuel Kant only interested in the foundations for knowledge of the physical world? No. In addition to what Kant held to be man's universal off or the starry heavens above, he addressed the moral law within as a subject of practical reason. He also had lasting things to say about the self and belief in God. What did Anne Conway's physical pain have to do with her philosophy and religion? Anne was born December 14, 1630, a week after her father. Sir Hanig Finch, who was Speaker of the House of Commons, died. Having learned Latin, Greek, and Hebrew at home, she began a correspondence with Henry Moore. 1614-1687, who had been her brother's tutor at Christ College. Moore held her in very high intellectual esteem, and their correspondence continued after she married Edward Conway. At the age of 20. Moore wrote of her that he had scarce ever met with any person, man or woman, of better natural parts than Lady Conway. One of her motivations for studying philosophy and possibly converting to Quakerism was her need to reconcile the existence of a good, all-powerful God with pain and suffering in the world. And herself was afflicted with extraordinarily severe headaches all her life. At one point, she had her jugular arteries bled in search of relief. What did Hume have to say about the self? Hume famously denied any evidence for the existence of a self as a substance or soul. He wrote, For my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other, of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception. And never can observe anything but the perception. He went on to explain that what a person calls his or her self is no more than a bundle or bundles of perceptions. No one of which is a direct idea of a self thing.
Who was Anne Conway? Anne Conway, 1630-1679, was best known in philosophy for her. The Principles of the Most Ancient and Modern Philosophy, 1690 This work was meant to overthrow both René Descartes, 1596-1650, Dualism and that of Henry Moore, 1614-1687 She posited an infinite number of ordered monads each one of which was a congealed spirit as the ultimate components of reality. She was influenced by Flemish alchemist Franciscus Mercurius van Helmont, who showed her work to Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716. Leibniz himself acknowledged her influence, and some think he got the term monad from her. What was original about Locke's thoughts concerning education? Locke originally wrote down his ideas in answer to his relative Edward Clark, who asked how he should raise his son to grow up to be a gentleman. There was broad interest in this subject among a new group of property owners who had representation in their government and were neither poor nor idly rich. Locke's letters to Clark were first published anonymously in 1693, and then became Some Thoughts Concerning Education, which went through 24 editions by 1800, five of which Locke supervised before he died. Locke advised that the temperament of the child should be observed so that having once established your authority and the ascendant over him. The next thing must be to bend the crooks the other way if he have any in him. But he counseled a light touch concerning physical discipline, which was an innovation. And he suggested that shame was a better tool than corporeal punishment. Locke's system for bringing up male children to become men of property and affairs involved an austere diet. Trained bowels, hard beds, early rising. And plenty of exercise outdoors with bare heads and wet feet in all kinds of weather. The fondness of mothers and superstitions of servants were to be minimized. Locke assumed that self-discipline in childhood would result in strong adults. Locke thought children should be educated at home, by sober tutors, with an emphasis on learning languages. He had no use for poetry or abstract, speculative learning, but advised that astronomy, geography, anatomy, history, and geometry be part of the home curriculum. He also advised that a gentleman's son acquire skill in at least one manual trade. Such as painting, woodworking, gardening, or metalworking. Was Immanuel Kant a recluse? Yes. He lived a very precise and orderly life. And his neighbors claimed to be able to set their clocks by his daily walks. During the 1770s, he retreated into what biographers call his silent decade. 
he set himself the task of figuring out how perception and intellect are connected. Never a bon vivant, he withdrew from even minimal social contact. But he was very forthright about what was going on in his life and did not make the usual social excuses. When a former student tried to coax him out, he responded in this manner. Any change makes me apprehensive, even if it offers the greatest promise of improving my condition. And I am persuaded by this natural instinct of mine that I must take heed if I wish that. The threads which the fates spin so thin and weak in my case to be spun to any length. My great thanks, to my well-wishers and friends, who think so kindly of me as to undertake my welfare. But at the same time a most humble request to protect me in my current condition from any disturbance. What was Immanuel Kant's moral system? Kant's moral starting point is the distinction between things that are instrumentally or hypothetically good because they have good consequences, and things that are good in and of themselves. The only thing that is good in itself is a good will or benevolence, without which every other gift of fortune can be just cause for resentment. Morality is for rational beings, and rational beings require principles of action. In the community of rational beings, or the kingdom of ends. Actions are good if they are autonomous, which is to say freely chosen. According to Kant, a rational being is autonomous or self-ruling. The rules that a rational being uses to regulate himself are absolute what Kant called categorical. Such rules are imperatives and are followed for their own sake. Hypothetical rules, by contrast, are followed in order to make something else happen. For example, do not harm innocent people would be a categorical. Rule and eat your vegetables would be a hypothetical rule. How was Hume a man of contradictions? Hume is famous for having written, Be a philosopher, but amidst all your philosophy, be still a man. Hume described himself as a man of mild dispositions, of command of temper, of an open, social, and cheerful humor, capable of attachment, but little susceptible of enmity, and of great moderation in all my passions. During his last painful illness with cancer, when his friend Adam Smith 1723-1790, visited him, he was calm and had no regrets about his atheism. Nor did he desire to make a religious conversion in case there was an afterlife. He did in fact have a lifelong reputation of being pleasant and highly reasonable. He was known as the The Good David, in England and L.E. Bon Davide in France. But, concerning his moderation, Hume very much enjoyed fine food and drink and weighted over 300 pounds. And as for his mildness, his friendship with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712-1778, suggests otherwise. When Rousseau was given refuge in England. Partly due to Hume's efforts, 
in 1766, Hume soon came to regret it. Although L.E. Bon Davide had enjoyed great fame in the salons of Paris, Rousseau was a world celebrity of greater wattage. Rousseau was also financially pressed and very sensitive to public opinion. He wore exotic costumes and was made fun of in state English society. Hume did nothing to temper this reaction. Rousseau soon became distrustful of Hume's friendship and accused him of perfidy. Instead of letting the matter rest, Hume published their correspondence. Going against the advice of his close friends, who were prepared to make allowances for Rousseau. Because they knew how personally troubled he was. This publication, together with Hume's denial that he had himself leaked the letters, destroyed his friendship with Rousseau and incurred skepticism about his own goodwill, good sense, and underlying motives. What was Immanuel Kant's second formulation of the categorical imperative? According to Kant, all rational beings are intrinsically valuable. And in the kingdom of ends, no one is a means to the end of anyone else. In the world of affairs what we do and who we are have prices. But in the kingdom of ends there are no prices, only dignities. The second formulation of the categorical imperative is that one must always act to treat humanity. Either as another person or oneself, as an end and never as a means. In other words, don't use people. Why were Locke's views on religion influential? Locke held a common sense view of religion and advised toleration of competing sects within Protestantism. His toleration did not extend to Catholicism, however. Although that did not diminish its force within the Protestant community. In The Reasonableness of Christianity, 1695, he allowed for the validity of revelation. But only insofar as it did not violate previously accepted facts or beliefs. He suggested that the Church of England could be reformed to attract dissenters by diminishing the power of its bishops, eliminating all mysteries, rituals, and superstitions in belief, and reducing its creed to simply an acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. In his letter on toleration, 1689, Locke argued against religious persecution of all kinds or any laws that interfered with those religious practices that would be lawful if they were not specifically religious. Part of his argument was the pragmatic one that suppression of religious beliefs unnecessarily breeds rebellion. His overall endorsement of toleration, particularly on the part of government, was to have a later influence on the separation between church and state in the U.S. Constitution. What is known about Immanuel Kant's life?
Immanuel Kant was born in Königsberg in East Prussia. His father was a saddler, and his grandfather was a Scottish immigrant. After attending the local high school, he was taught by the philosopher Marin Knudsen at the University of Königsberg. He worked as a tutor and returned to take a master's degree, after which he was employed as a privat docent. Private docent, or PD, to teach physics, mathematics, anthropology, geography, and some philosophy. In his courses on anthropology and geology. He taught the prevailing view of European racial supremacy over Asians and Africans. He was poor until 1770, when he secured the position of Chair of Logic and Metaphysics at Königsberg. Other European intellectuals, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712-1778, whom Kant greatly admired. Constantly moved and traveled to secure their fame and livings, with amorous and political adventure. As a kind of byproduct of their intellectual careers. But that was not for Kant. He never left the area of East Prussia. And remained a bachelor in Königsberg, now Kaliningrad, all his life. When the Prussian king asked him not to publish further about religion in 1794, he duly complied. Kant's health was fragile, but he took care of himself, living until he was 80. He relied on travelers and published works for information about the outside world and was content to dine with friends and fulfill his professorial duties, including a term as rector of the university. Kant's early works were about natural science. The most notable being his general history of nature and theory of the heavens, 1755. His magnum opus was the critique of pure reason. But when it finally appeared in 1781 few could understand it. He tried to make his ideas more accessible in his prolegomena to every future metaphysics, 1783. This was followed by his 1790 critique of practical reason and the critique of judgment. In 1793 and 1797, he published religion within the bounds of mere reason and the metaphysic of morals. Kant was by then famous, but younger thinkers undertook to explain his system better than he had. He was working on his response to them in his opus posthumum when he died. Did Hume believe that we have free will? Yes, Hume believed in free will, but in a strange way. He argued that our freedom is based on the fact that we are determined by our existing character. If there were no causal link between our motives and our actions, then there would be no moral basis for praise and blame. That is, we do not praise or blame others for what they do accidentally or as flukes. For Hume, freedom therefore consists in the liberty to do what we want, or a lack of constraint. Our spontaneity is not the same as indifference, or the lack of a cause for doing one thing or the other. He wrote, by liberty, then, we can mean a power of acting or not acting. According to the determinations of the will. Now this hypothetical liberty is. 
universally allowed to belong to everyone who is not a prisoner and in chains. Was Rousseau a hypocrite? Based on his assumption that children were naturally good and that the purpose of education was to nurture this goodness. Jean Jacques Rousseau, 1712-1778, became the leading educational theorist of his age. His Emile, or, On Education, is a loving account of the development of a young boy under the guidance of Rousseau. The boy is raised in the countryside, where there are less corrupting influences and his mind is not taxed. Until he is 12. This is a progressive education set up to draw out the nature of the child. Nature wants children to be children before being men. Childhood has its own ways of seeing, thinking, and feeling. Emile then learns a skill. Carpentry. And at 16 he is introduced to Sophie, who has been selected as his maid. Sophie has been educated to be governed, whereas Emile is taught the principles of self government. Rousseau himself is said to have had five children by Therese Levasseur. And each one was brought to an orphanage at birth. Those individuals who already hated Rousseau, such as Voltaire, 1694-1778, pointed out that most children in orphanages at that time perished. Rousseau's only defense was that he did not think he would have been a good father. When a friend of Rousseau's noted that the course of education described in Emile was not practical, Rousseau wrote back, you say quite correctly that it is impossible to produce an Emile. But I cannot believe that you take the book that carries this name for a true treatise on education. It is rather a philosophical work on this principle advanced. By the author in other writings that man is naturally good. If Rousseau did not take himself seriously as an educational theorist, then his own behavior as a parent would not have meant that he was a hypocrite on that score. The question, however, remains whether this behavior qualifies him as naturally good. So the question of hypocrisy does not go away that easily. What was Immanuel Kant's Copernican revolution? Just as Copernicus changed the center of our universe from Earth to Sun, Kant relocated the basic principles and categories of reality, as studied by science, from the external world to the mind. Like John Locke, 1632 to 1704, he began with an examination of the powers of the mind. And an aim to reject metaphysical claims that could not be rationally justified. He posited a human rational necessity to understand real experience in space and time and a practical need to live with other rational beings seeking the principles that could fulfill those requirements. In 1770 Kant argued in on the form and principles of the sensible and intelligible world that our knowledge of space and time is only about appearances, but that we are still justified in making limited claims about what lies behind those appearances. 
This was the foundation for what became known as critical philosophy. Kant's revolutionary claim was that we have a priori knowledge of both space and time. Because they are the forms of our perception, space is the organization of experience in the outer world. While time is the organization of experience in the inner world. This was followed by the two editions of his critique of pure reason. With his prolegomena to any future metaphysics published in between to respond to criticism. Why was the single status of early modern men of science and philosophy important? Inevitably, bachelorhood would have had the negative effect of not having long-term intimate relationships or much experience with children and family life in adulthood. A bachelor's style of life would have then supported a view of the world from the perspective of a lone individual and an assumption that the philosophical mind would always have the same gender as oneself. Why are Immanuel Kant's epistemology and metaphysics transcendental? To this day, philosophers dispute whether Kant was providing a theory of how the mind in fact works or instead a critical theory of how we ought to view knowledge. In either case, Kant's epistemology and metaphysics are both transcendental. His epistemology is transcendental in that he reasons a priori from what is known to what must be the case in order to account for what is known. And his metaphysics is transcendental in that what ultimately exists exceeds and eludes both our direct knowledge and full understanding. Even though we are justified in postulating it according to certain principles of reason. What was Immanuel Kant's notion of synthetic a priori knowledge? Knowledge is synthetic or ampliative, according to Kant. If it is about objects that can be experienced in the world, it is a priori if it can be known without experience. What was Hume's problem of induction? Hume introduced an enormous problem with how we reason from past or present to the future that still plagues philosophers of science and epistemologists today. He pointed out that no matter how comprehensive our past experience, it is never a logical contradiction to deny that the same thing which happened in the past will happen in the future. Take the idea that the sun will rise tomorrow. Although we have always known it to rise every day. It is not a contradiction to say it won't rise tomorrow. If one objects that past experience gives us regularities between events. Like those that occur today and the sun rising thereafter. Hume's response would be that we do not know that those regularities will occur in the future. To take another example, oxygen, friction, 
and combustible material have always resulted in fire. But maybe in the future that very combination will not be followed by fire. Hume's problem of induction goes beyond saying that we never know enough to predict the future. His claim is that even when we do know enough to predict the future, where that knowledge has been proven in past experience, we do not know that the patterns of our experience in the future will resemble the patterns of the past. Of course, he did not disregard probability or prudence. His attack was on the notion that we can be certain about the future. Why do Locke's biographers consider his last years happy ones? After a life of moving from one place to another, when Locke's health began to fail in the early 1690s, he moved into the home of Damaris Cudworth, who had become Lady Masham. Biographers think it probable that he had been close to proposing to her decades earlier. When Locke joined the Masham household, he was on friendly terms with Sir Francis Masham, Damaris' husband. And he insisted on paying one pound weekly rent, although he would have been welcome as a guest. He brought with him his personal library of 5,000 books and his personal effects. All of which were inventoried on a list that Lady Masham signed, a regular practice for Locke, whenever he moved. The country air at Oates, in Essex, was better for his lungs than London had been and he was able to continue his writing. Receive visitors and keep up his correspondence until he died. This arrangement, however, was not without its detractors. John Edwards, who believed that Locke's reasonableness of Christianity was a subversive and even atheistic work, referred to Locke as the governor of the Seraglio brothel at Oates. What was unusual about Hume's theory of the emotions? Although Hume exalted reason over faith when it came to knowledge, when it came to human psychology he believed that we are primarily motivated by our emotions or passions and that reason is always in the service of these emotions. That is, unlike Benedict de Spinoza, 1632-1677, he did not have a cognitive theory of the emotions. According to which what we feel is the result of what we believe. Hume wrote, reason is, and ought only to be, the slave of the passions. What was new in Hume's views on religion? In his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, c. 1750s, Hume argued against both a priori and empirical proofs for the existence of God. This was an attack on rational grounds for religious belief. His argument against a priori arguments or the ontological argument used by René Descartes. 1596-1650, was to claim that nothing that exists can exist necessarily. That is, it is not a logical contradiction to assert the non-existence of anything, including God. 
his empirical arguments were mainly directed against the cosmological argument and the argument from design. Against the cosmological argument that held the world must have had a maker. Hume claimed that we do not have enough knowledge about the origins of worlds to justify a hypothesis about how this one came about. The argument from design held that just as things such as houses and watches must have builders. The world, insofar as it works well within itself, must have a designer. Hume's response was that we have no grounds to reason from what is true of any one thing within the world to the entire world itself. If Hume's arguments hold, then the only grounds left for religious belief are those of pure faith. What was Rousseau's life like? Rousseau's life seemed to spin out of control from time to time. Although he found a degree of stability, intellectually, in his writing. He was born in Geneva, Switzerland. In 1712 and always considered himself a citizen of that canton, city-state. His mother died nine days after his birth. His father, an unsuccessful watchmaker, and his aunt raised him. His father was an emotional man, often reading sentimental novels and Plutarch. As a boy, he was subjected to abuse outside the family. In his confessions, Rousseau described the erotic effect of corporal punishment from a pastor's sister. Later, a notary and an engraver, to whom he was apprenticed, abused him. Rousseau left Geneva at the age of 16, and soon met Françoise Louise de Warens, a Catholic noblewoman who became his lover and motivated him to convert to Catholicism. In 1742, he went to Paris to present a new system of musical. Notation to the Academy de Sciences, but his system was rejected. He then became secretary to the French ambassador in Venice, Italy, in 1743, but left within a year after quarreling with him. Back in Paris, he began a lifelong relationship with a seamstress named Therese Levasseur. He met Denis Diderot, 1713-1784, and began contributing articles on music to his encyclopedia. He then submitted an essay for a competition at the Academy of Dijon in answer to the question of whether the arts and sciences had benefited mankind. Rousseau's resounding negative answer was discourse on the arts and sciences. 1750, it won and made him famous. His opera Le Devon du Village was much appreciated by King Louis XV. But Rousseau did not get a pension from him because he immediately supported Italian over French music. Rousseau then returned to Geneva and converted back to Calvinism. He wrote the Discourse on Inequality in 1755, which caused an alienation from Diderot and other patrons. Because it claimed that most human inequalities were the result of society. Not nature, Rousseau believed man was born good. But he secured the support of the very rich Duke de Luxembourg. His romantic novel Julie, 
Oyu La Nouvelle Heloise was a big success and was followed by of the social contract. 1762, also known as Principles of Political Right, and Emile, or, on education, 1762. All of these writings were critical of established religion and therefore banned in both France and the canton or city-state of Geneva. Rousseau fled arrest in 1762, brought on by the uproar about his political ideas, and after some disorganized travels. Finally, in 1765, prevailed on the hospitality of the very English David Hume, 1711-1776. The latter situation did not work out, however. Rousseau re-entered France in 1770 under the assumed name Renaud, and went to Paris. He had begun work on the Confessions, in England. But the completed edition was not published until after his death. He wrote considerations on the government of Poland after an invitation to make recommendations for a constitution for the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This was followed by his Dialoges, Rousseau, 1776, published in 1782. Confessions of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1782, and Reveries of the Solitary Walker, 1782. He then wrote an analysis of Gluck's opera Alciste, before dying suddenly in 1778. What was Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative? Kant is usually interpreted to have two formulations. First, act so that the maxim of your action, or the generalization describing it, can be willed by you to be a general rule to be followed by all rational agents. In other words, only do those things that you as a benevolent, rational being can will that everyone do. The test of a categorical imperative is what happens if everyone follows it. Something that has good consequences in a particular case might not have good consequences in all cases. For example, if the maxim is obey traffic rules, and you come to a red light with no other cars in attendance. You may not drive through it, even though the consequences in this particular case would be benign. Or, to use an example of Kant's, if the maxim is not to lie, and a madman is looking for a friend. Of yours whose whereabouts you know, you may not lie in this case. Because overall you can't benevolently will that everyone be permitted to lie whenever the consequences are good for them. To take another example of Kant's, you may not take your own life. No matter how miserable you are, because you categorically can't will suicide as a good action. Why is gender an important topic in studies of early modern philosophy? Social and family life, generally, and ideas about the sexes were so different. In the 17th century compared to our own that they should not be. Overlooked as an important background to the beginnings of modern philosophy. 
Interestingly, all the well-known 17th century philosophers Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Hobbes, and Locke were bachelors their entire lives. As were the great majority of their colleagues in philosophy and the sciences. What was Immanuel Kant's proof of God's existence? Kant rejected the ontological argument on the ground that existence is not a quality or characteristic of things. According to Kant, we cannot say that the sweater is red, wool, and it exists. He rejected the first cause argument as partly relying on the ontological argument. And he rejected the argument from design on the grounds that, at best, it proves only an architect or designer of the universe, and not a creator. Kant himself thought there was a moral proof for God's existence because the moral agent knows that he cannot achieve his goals on his own without God. The resulting belief in God becomes a matter of individual personal conviction not it is morally certain that there is a God, but I am morally certain that there is a God. What was Immanuel Kant's proof of God's existence? Kant rejected the ontological argument on the ground that existence is not a quality or characteristic of things. According to Kant, we cannot say that the sweater is red, wool, and it exists. He rejected the first cause argument as partly relying on the ontological argument. And he rejected the argument from design on the grounds that, at best, it proves only an architect or designer of the universe, and not a creator. Kant himself thought there was a moral proof for God's existence because the moral agent knows that he cannot achieve his goals on his own without God. The resulting belief in God becomes a matter of individual personal conviction not it is morally certain that there is a God, but I am morally certain that there is a God. Which of the other Enlightenment thinkers were most directly relevant to philosophy? Among the other Enlightenment thinkers of note in the area of philosophy is Mary Wollstonecraft. 1759-1797, the mother of Frankenstein novelist Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. She contributed the foundations for feminist thought. Her husband was anarchist and political philosopher William Godwin. 1756 to 1836, known for his determinist utilitarianism. The French philosophes, particularly the encyclopedists, contributed radical ideas about society and government. Voltaire, François Marie Rouet, 1694 to 1778 brought key philosophical ideas to a wider audience. Enlightenment thought in general had a powerful effect on the American colonies and the establishing principles of the United States of America.
Which of the other Enlightenment thinkers were most directly relevant to philosophy? Among the other Enlightenment thinkers of note in the area of philosophy is Mary Wollstonecraft. 1759-1797, the mother of Frankenstein novelist Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. She contributed the foundations for feminist thought. Her husband was anarchist and political philosopher William Godwin. 1756 to 1836, known for his determinist utilitarianism. The French philosophes, particularly the encyclopedists, contributed radical ideas about society and government. Voltaire, François Marie Arouet, 1694 to 1778 brought key philosophical ideas to a wider audience. Enlightenment thought in general had a powerful effect on the American colonies and the establishing principles of the United States of America. Who was Mary Wollstonecraft? Mary Wollstonecraft, 1759-1797, is considered the founder of modern feminism in the West. She wrote at the time of the French Revolution and contributed to democratic ideas, generally, in vindication of the rights of men, as well as to arguments for the equality of women in vindication of the rights of women. She also wrote novels, an autobiographical travel essay, and shorter works on education. Who was Mary Wollstonecraft? Mary Wollstonecraft 1759-1797, is considered the founder of modern feminism in the West. She wrote at the time of the French Revolution and contributed to democratic ideas, generally, in vindication of the rights of men, as well as to arguments for the equality of women in vindication of the rights of women. She also wrote novels, an autobiographical travel essay, and shorter works on education. What were Wollstonecraft's main political ideas? In Vindication of the Rights of Men 1790, she argued against Irish statesman and political theorist Edmund Burke's. 1729-1797, conservative attack on the ideals of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. Her claim that Burke's endorsement of custom and tradition implied that slavery was acceptable made her famous overnight. Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792, in which Wollstonecraft sounded a clarion call for the recognition of women as human beings, was innovative in its progressive thought. What were Wollstonecraft's main political ideas?
in vindication of the rights of men. 1790, she argued against Irish statesman and political theorist Edmund Burke's. 1729-1797, conservative attack on the ideals of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. Her claim that Burke's endorsement of custom and tradition implied that slavery was acceptable made her famous overnight. Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792, in which Wollstonecraft sounded a clarion call for the recognition of women as human beings, was innovative in its progressive thought. What did Wollstonecraft claim on behalf of women? Mary Estelle, 1666-1731, and Elizabeth Elstub, 1683-1756. Preceded Wollstonecraft in arguing for women's recognition as thinking persons. Estelle claimed that women were entitled to be educated. Her reason for this was that women had the same God-given capacity to reason as men. Her justification for educating women was that this could help them be better wives and mothers. Wollstonecraft shared Estelle's views and defended them more systematically. She also claimed that the current treatment of privileged women as spaniels and toys was demeaning to them. She took Jean Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, to task for claiming in his hugely popular novel Emile. 1762, that women should be educated to provide soothing pleasure to men. She wrote openly about female sexuality and the emotional vulnerability of women to rakes. Arguing that women were educated to be impulsive, emotional, and gullible. What did Wollstonecraft claim on behalf of women? Mary Estelle. 1666 to 1731 and Elizabeth Elstub 1683 to 1756 preceded Wollstonecraft in arguing for women's recognition as thinking persons Estelle claimed that women were entitled to be educated her reason for this was that women had the same god-given capacity to reason as men her justification for educating women was that this could help them be better wives and mothers. Wollstonecraft shared Estelle's views and defended them more systematically. She also claimed that the current treatment of privileged women as spaniels and toys was demeaning to them. She took Jean Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, to task for claiming in his hugely popular novel Emile. 1762, that women should be educated to provide soothing pleasure to men. She wrote openly about female sexuality and the emotional vulnerability of women to rakes. Arguing that women were educated to be impulsive, emotional, and gullible. What were Wollstonecraft's theoretical innovations?
Mary Wollstonecraft developed the arguments of the 17th century anonymous writer who said in an essay in defense of the female sex, the usurpation of man, and the tyranny of custom, here in England. Especially, that women had the traits they did because of the role society assigned them. However, Wollstonecraft stopped short of condemning men for this or claiming that women were superior or equal to men in character or strength. Wollstonecraft's general contribution to political and social theory was twofold. First, in the case of women, she offered a detailed analysis of how their customary upbringing and assigned roles in society caused them to develop those traits that were considered natural to the female sex, emotionality, submissiveness, impulsiveness, vanity. Second, she pursued the assumption that reason could be used to improve human happiness. In both of her major works, she assumed that it was the obligation of rational people of both sexes to endorse social progress and human equality. Wollstonecraft's progressiveness was focused on the life conditions of those who were disadvantaged and oppressed. Which was not the case with leading male. Political philosophers in the 17th century, or even during the Enlightenment. In that sense, she was a revolutionary thinker. What were Wollstonecraft's theoretical innovations? Mary Wollstonecraft developed the arguments of the 17th century anonymous writer who said in an essay in defense of the female sex, the usurpation of man, and the tyranny of custom, here in England especially, that women had the traits they did because of the role society assigned them. However, Wollstonecraft stopped short of condemning men for this or claiming that women were superior or equal to men in character or strength. Wollstonecraft's general contribution to political and social theory was twofold. First, in the case of women, she offered a detailed analysis of how their customary upbringing and assigned roles in society caused them to develop those traits that were considered natural to the female sex, emotionality, submissiveness, impulsiveness, vanity. Second, she pursued the assumption that reason could be used to improve human happiness. In both of her major works, she assumed that it was the obligation of rational people of both sexes to endorse social progress and human equality. Wollstonecraft's progressiveness was focused on the life conditions of those who were disadvantaged and oppressed. Which was not the case with leading male. Political philosophers in the 17th century, or even during the Enlightenment. In that sense, she was a revolutionary thinker. How did the facts of Wollstonecraft's life obscure her work? Mary Wollstonecraft's life was tumultuous in a way that was shocking to her peers and many later thinkers. Her husband, the philosopher William Godwin, 1756-1836, wrote the memoirs of the author of A Vindication. 
of the rights of woman a year after Mary had died in childbirth at the age of 37. Godwin The founder of modern anarchism, was vilified by the poet Robert Southey for the want of all feeling in stripping his dead wife naked. And in a satire called The Unsexed Females, a poem, 1798, published by Richard Polbley. Mary Wollstonecraft was born in Spitalfields, London. And her father squandered their money and took over her own small inheritance. He drank excessively and beat Mary's mother. Her sisters, Everina and Eliza, were also to have unhappy marriages. In her teens, Mary became friends with Jane Arden, whose family had intellectual interests, and Fanny Blood, with whom she later started a school in Newington Green, which was known as a dissenting community. Blood married, became ill, and died. The school fell apart, and Wollstonecraft worked as a governess. Leaving after a year when she decided to support herself by writing. This was a very daring ambition for a woman at the time. And Wollstonecraft called herself the first of a new genus. In London, she was assisted by the publisher Joseph Johnson. She became part of a circle that included Thomas Paine and William Godwin. And supported herself by translating French and German texts after learning those languages. She had an affair with the married artist Henry Fuseli. Who rejected her when his wife refused a platonic menage à trois. She then wrote Vindication of the Rights of Men, 1790, followed by Vindication of the Rights of Women. 1792, and travelled to France a month before Louis XVI was guillotined. There she fell in love with the adventurer Gilbert Imlay, with whom she had her daughter, Fanny. Imlay rejected Mary, and when she returned to England she twice tried to commit suicide. Eventually, she became romantically attached to Godwin and they married so that their child would be legitimate, though they lived in separate houses. Their daughter, Mary, became Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Fanny committed suicide at the age of 22. How did the facts of Wollstonecraft's life obscure her work? Mary Wollstonecraft's life was tumultuous in a way that was shocking to her peers and many later thinkers. Her husband, the philosopher William Godwin, 1756-1836, wrote the memoirs of the author of A Vindication. Of the rights of woman a year after Mary had died in childbirth at the age of 37. Godwin the founder of modern anarchism, was vilified by the poet Robert Southey for the want of all feeling in stripping his dead wife naked. And in a satire called The Unsexed Females, a poem, 1798, published by Richard Polbley. Mary Wollstonecraft was born in Spitalfields, London. And her father squandered their money and took over her own small inheritance. He drank excessively and beat Mary's mother. Her sisters, Everina and Eliza, were also to have unhappy marriages. 
In her teens, Mary became friends with Jane Arden, whose family had intellectual interests, and Fanny Blood, with whom she later started a school in Newington Green, which was known as a dissenting community. Blood married, became ill, and died. The school fell apart, and Wollstonecraft worked as a governess. Leaving after a year when she decided to support herself by writing. This was a very daring ambition for a woman at the time. And Wollstonecraft called herself the first of a new genus. In London, she was assisted by the publisher Joseph Johnson. She became part of a circle that included Thomas Paine and William Godwin. And supported herself by translating French and German texts after learning those languages. She had an affair with the married artist Henry Fuseli. Who rejected her when his wife refused a platonic menage à trois. She then wrote Vindication of the Rights of Men, 1790, followed by Vindication of the Rights of Women. 1792, and travelled to France a month before Louis XVI was guillotined. There she fell in love with the adventurer Gilbert Imlay, with whom she had her daughter, Fanny. Imlay rejected Mary, and when she returned to England she twice tried to commit suicide. Eventually, she became romantically attached to Godwin and they married so that their child would be legitimate, though they lived in separate houses. Their daughter, Mary, became Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Fanny committed suicide at the age of 22.